Hello, I'm Senior Programmer Jen Wilson, and welcome to this film independent present Q&A for the Sony Pictures classic documentary, Turn Every Page, The Adventures of Robert Caro and Robert Gottlieb by Lizzie Gottlieb. Special thanks to our lead sponsor, the HIFPA, and our virtual screenings partner, Vision Media. And now please welcome our guest director, Lizzie Gottlieb. Thank you so much for joining us, Lizzie. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so we have a lot of film independent members that are aspiring filmmakers. And because of that, I usually ask a question at the top of our guest. How did you become a filmmaker? Oh, gosh. Well, I was a theater director for a very long time. Um, I started and, and ran an off-Broadway theater company in New York. And I had a kind of lightning bolt moment of a documentary I wanted to make about my younger brother who's autistic. And I suddenly thought, I'd been thinking I should make a fiction film about him. And I thought, oh my God, it should be a documentary. Literally sat up in bed one morning with this thought. And I was working with a guy who was a Broadway producer and we were out one night and he said, I wanna change my life and produce documentaries. And I said, oh, I have a great idea for one. He said, great, I'll produce it. How long will it take you? And I said, it'll take me six months. And it took me six years to make that <laughs> um, because I think I had this slightly arrogant feeling that like, oh, I understand storytelling. So it's not that different from theater, but of course it's very, very different. And I, I think making a film about your family is also so complicated. So it took me a really long time to figure out how to do it. And I kind of learned as I, as I went along on that one. What, what is that film called? That film is called Today's Man. It was on PBS. Yes. Okay. Great. I'll have to check that out. Um, so this this film is about uh, author Robert Caro and his working relationship with his longtime editor, Robert Gottlieb. Um, they wrote the Pulitzer Prize winner, um, The Power Broker, together. I have well, to say... Robert Caro wrote it. Robert Caro wrote it. It was edited by Robert Gottlieb. Robert Gottlieb wrote it. Um, I have to say that I'd never heard of this book or either one of these guys. Is it, is it a very niche kind of book that only a certain group of people have read? Cause now I'm fascinated and really want to read it. But, um, you know, Caro yeah. has written to, he's written the power broker and then he has been writing this series of books about Lyndon Johnson for 50 years. Right. And Caro, I'm, I'm going to get to your question. I'm just giving some background. You know, Caro writes, as he says, not just the stories of, of important men, but he writes about how power works in our country and how power affects the powerless. And so I think those books have meant an enormous amount to a lot of different people in a lot of different areas, you know, people in government, people in urban planning, people who are interested in history, people who are interested in power of all kinds. So are they niche books? I think it's a quite large niche, but I, and I think people who've read them feel that they're in on some secret kind of society of people who understand how things have actually happened in our country. Um, but I really wanted this film to work for people who have read the books and love them and are on the edge of their seats about when the next one will come out. And also for people who've never heard of them. Do you know, I think um, to me, the film is about a collaboration, about, you know, creative collaboration, about joy and work. Um, so many things also about what does it take to kind of get to the truth of what has happened, what is happening, you know, all of these things, dedication to craft. So, so I hope that the film is meaningful to people who love the books and also meaningful to people who haven't read them and maybe never will read them. Um, yeah, I, fa I found this completely fascinating. And, and of course, their relationship, which we'll talk about in a second, also completely fascinating. Um, so, a spoiler alert, Robert Gottlieb's actually your dad. True. And uh, when, uh, when, about when did you first start to think that you should make a doc about, about um, Bob? Did, does he go by Bob Caro? Yeah. Bob Caro and your dad, Robert Gottlieb. 
it was a little bit of a white whale for me, this film. You know, I um I had this very strong feeling that this film would work and that it would matter. <laughs> um, and I don't really know why, because um the story about two very old guys whose activity is sitting in chairs and putting words on paper does not really seem like a cinematic bonanza. Um, but I just felt so strongly, I'm going to back up a little bit. I grew up in this house where my dad's writers were always part of our family, you know, close, close friends. And I had never met Robert Carroll. So there was something different about this relationship. And at a certain point, some years ago, about seven years ago, I heard Bob Carroll give a speech about his working relationship with my father and how contentious it is and how they disagree over semicolons. And it just started, I, I just started to think there's something there because I wasn't really interested in telling a story of like of a great writer or a great editor, but the thought of this dynamic between them, this relationship that's so thorny and complicated and productive, and in fact, ultimately, I think quite loving, I just thought what a window into the world of book publishing, you know, which I think people read books, but nobody really knows how they come to be. And I thought what an incredible opportunity that was to look at that and to look at this history of 50 years of this relationship developing and these books coming to me to be. And also it's an ongoing relationship there. The Robert Caro is trying to finish his last volume of his last book. He's 87 years old. My father is 91 and they're in this race against time to try to finish their life's work. So there's so much at stake for them and for us, you know, the readers who want to have the story revealed and so much at stake for me personally, as my father is 91 and I'm sort of trying to hold on to every moment I can with him. So it felt important and maybe even urgent to tell the story right now. So in the scene where, where your dad is going through the bookstore um, and talking about the books that he's edited and holding up things like Catch-22, <laughs> talking about how he suggested the title, is that is that his grandson with him in the scene? He That's my son. That's, That's my your son. son. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, editors, I feel like editors really get short shrift unless you're in the publishing and liter world of literature and writing. I feel you know, I feel like writers would definitely know who your father is, but it, it feels like, you know, it's like films. Like the director gets the credit for films and the author of the book gets the credit. But when for writing the book, but um, your dad is really a, a, an extremely prolific editor. And I don't know very much about the editing world, but he says he might've, he might've edited 700 or 800 books. Is that a lot for an editor to be <laughs> accomplish in their lifetime? I think it's quite a lot. Um, it's true. You know, the job of an editor is to disappear right? My father says in the film, it's a service job. You're in service of the book. I think it's, you know, well, we can talk about the difference between that and a film editor, which I think is a different job. But but in both cases, your job is, right, to disappear, to make the work better. Um, so if an editor is, a, is famous or getting a lot of attention, maybe they're not doing it right in some way, right? Um, but I, so it makes sense that my father is known within the literary world, but not so much outside of the literary world, I think. He has edited a lot, a lot of books. I mean, he started as an editor in 1955, and he is still going. So that's a lot of years. Yeah. Um, and he's very, very fast and very, very focused and industrious. Uh, so there's a lot of, yeah, he's, he's done so much in all that time. Well, his, they say in the movie that he can read a book overnight, which I don't know if he still does, but he not he not only reads that book, he gives the, the attention and editor's attention and gives notes. That's insane. 
I wouldn't even hope to be able to read most books in, in one night. Uh, had he always had this skill of being able to read that quickly? He says that he had to learn to slow himself down when he became an editor because he's a very fast reader. So I think what he does is he reads everything he gets overnight um, as a first read for first impression so that he can call the writer the next day. You know, he's always said that's the greatest thing you can do as an editor is have a swift response Um, because the authors are out there waiting, waiting to hear what you think their heart on their sleeve. So I think he reads them overnight and calls the next day with his response. And then he goes in again and works on them and, and edits them and goes back and forth with the writers. And he still does that. I it's a also, lot oh, sorry, go ahead. It's a lot to live up to. As yeah. his daughter. I actually, I actually totally related to that because he says at one point, like, yes, I do do that. But also, you know, please note that I don't, like regard it as a task I want to read it I can't wait to read it so when uh when I say like how many hundreds of movies I've seen in a year people are like why would you ever do that and it's like oh I don't have to I want to like I do this for my job but I also want to you know it's like kind of an obsessive feeling um because you just want to see all the movies that there are um, right. I think that's one of the things I wanted to capture is this incredible joy in work. And both of these men you feel are unbelievably galvanized and joyful might be too, uh, I don't know what that right word is, but they're, they take incredible joy and pleasure in their work. And I find that so inspiring. Your dad, So your dad says something, you say, to your dad, you know, Bob Caro has, has agreed to do this, but he won't be in the same room with you. And, and your dad says, well, do you blame him? Um, this is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And your, your dad has such a tremendously dry, but hilarious uh, sense of humor. Um, and Robert Caro is like a little more straightforward, which makes them kind of a comedy duo in a way. But I think that you're right in that their relationship is so it's strange, but it's also really taught their commitment to this work is really touching. And that, you know, when you end with that scene of them sitting like shoulder to shoulder with their pencils and the manuscript doing it, like I never imagined that that's how books get edited. I thought someone just sent it as a PDF or as a, you know, dot doc X to an editor's computer and then the editor just edits by itself themselves and send it back. I didn't realize it was such a personal communication. I'm not sure it always is, but in their case, it definitely is. And, you know, somebody who saw the film at a festival a couple of weeks ago said to me, this film is a love story and they don't get together till the last scene. <laughs> yeah. I loved that. I loved that comment. And I think she's right. It does. It, I, I do think that is something we were crafting. You know, we were given this kind of, when Bob Caro said he would do the movie, but he didn't want to be seen in the same room as my father, that struck me as so um, hilarious and a little bit enraging and quite touching and also sort of irresistible. <laughs> you know, okay, yeah. we're going to creep after these guys who are creeping after these historical figures and we're going to try to capture something. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, neither guy wanted to make this movie. I asked my father first and he said, absolutely not. He's quite fierce about it. And I kept asking and he finally said, well, you can ask Bob Caro, but he's going to say no. And I called Bob Caro because he doesn't email, of course. So I had to pick up the phone and call him and asked him. And he said, no, I don't speak publicly about my work or my process. And he said, but I saw a film you made that I quite admired. So why don't you come and talk to me? So I did. And he gradually over that conversation said, all right, I, I've never actually seen a film about a writer and an editor. And I think it might be important to show this to people. And I think he thought it would take me a couple months to make this movie. I don't think he thought it would take seven years. Um, but as it started to take more time, I think maybe he felt 
yeah. he recognized something in me and he was like, oh, that's my kind of girl. She takes a long time to make a movie. But I felt that his softening towards the filmmaking and towards me over the course of that period, I thought was a kind of important element in the film that they both kind of open up more and more yeah. towards us and, and, and towards each other. You can really see that in the film because by the time you get to Texas with uh, Bob and Ina, you can tell that he likes to, he's liking sitting and, and talking to you. He like, he's very, he's thought out way more than at the beginning of the film where he's just giving you like little breadcrumbs about what's going on. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the ultimate is when he shows you where he puts his, uh, um, copies up up above the refrigerator in his house it's like oh you hit the jackpot um i was so like my jaw was on the floor when he <laughs> over the refrigerator i really couldn't believe it i felt so lucky to be there to be seeing it these i mean there's something about the both of them that's incredibly quirky like when they first meet and then so they're making their plan as to when they're first going to get together and, and Bob suggests lunch and your dad's like, oh, no, I don't go out for lunch. So they get a sandwich and they stay. And it's like, who doesn't go out for lunch? OK, <laughs> he was he was when he was running Knopf for not having lunches. He's like, it's a waste of time. I need to work. I need to work. He said he once went out for a two martini lunch and then he, he spent three days recovering and he said never again. Just going to stay home, stay in the office, get the work done. It's very, it's like, I, I have a friend that will only come over to my house if it's at 630 and there is a parking space right in front of my house for her. <laughs> it's, it's that quirkiness, but I love it. I love that. I love that about people. They're very specific, you know, things that they have adjusted their life to. Um, you know, I have to say, if someone had given me Robert Caro's book, The Power Broker, and said and and said to read it, and I sort of looked him up and look at like what he writes, I probably would have been like, "This is a dude that that writes about powerful white guys." Like that sounds so grody. Um, but watching this movie. And hearing him talk about why he, you know, wrote about Robert Moses and about LBJ, volumes and volumes about LBJ. Uh, it's it's it really won me over um, because the why of it is fascinating. And you said it perfectly in the beginning. You said writing about people who have power for people who don't have any. Is that how you said it? Well, Lisa Lucas says in the movie, she says um, he's, well, he, he's writing about the effect of power on the powerless. Got and it. she says, if we understand power and what it does to people who don't have it, then maybe we can imagine a better future. Yeah. And I do think that Bob Caro has an unbelievable ability to go after, you know, there's this scene where he writes about Lyndon Johnson's cook, who the Lady Bird and Lyndon Johnson traveled from DC back to Texas every summer, and they made their cook travel, drive herself across the country with all their fancy dishes, their china, and their dog. But she, as a Black woman in America at that time, with a dog, was not allowed to stop anywhere to stay or to use a bathroom and that caro has tracked her down and is writing about her experience in service of lyndon johnson to me is such a strong example of what he's doing he's talking about you know that's tiny but it's also governmentally he's talking about how robert moses's plans destroyed neighborhoods. He's talking about the racism that was built into the actual structure of New York City that we're still living with today. So his kind of relentless search for what these powerful men did to the people who didn't have power is 
unbelievably awe-inspiring. Yeah. You know, as, as Majora Carter says in the film, she says it's not just that he had empathy. He says, use this information. She says it weaponized the work that she's doing today. And I, I think that's right. And I think that's why so many people care so deeply about these books. Do you think that... Um that your dad in his career has specifically chosen works like this that have like a, pow a powerful message for people? You know, I'm not sure there's a theme to the, what the books are about. And for my dad, like I have a lot of them right here behind me. Um, I think that he has looked for always books that are deeply effective, that, that, that are, that work that are great, great stories and sort of the writers who are at the top of their abilities and the top of their craft. So I think that's what he cares about the most. And then his job is to try to make them better if he can. I love the part at the end where you, where you ask Bob Caro if his research into politics and power gives him hope for our political future or despair. Can you talk about what his answer was and what you think it means? Yeah. I was nervous to ask him that because I feel that he's a little bit of an oracle, right? You know, he, if he doesn't know, then nobody knows. He's found out everything there is to find out. Um, and I asked him once if what he thought about what was going on now in our country. And he was like, I can't, I have to keep my head in the sixties. I can't talk about what's going on now. So it's like he couldn't talk about it directly. But I finally said, you know, does researching power as you do make you more or less hopeful for our country? And he gives this really profound answer that I'm always, every time I watch it, I'm still sort of on the edge of my seat. Like, what is there hope for us? I feel that we're saying. And, and his answer is that there's unbelievable hope for the potential of what government can do. He talks about Medicare and Medicaid and how that changed people's lives. And I think he talks about what Lyndon Johnson did for civil rights and how that changed so many people's lives. And then he talks about the devastation of government in the Vietnam War. And then he ultimately says, it's not hope or fear, it's awe, that he's in awe of what government can do. So, I don't know what we take from that, but there's a lot to take from that. I was really glad that's what the answer was. <laughs> I was like, yes, okay, it's good. And I felt like you, you too. I was like, if anybody knows, this guy does. And I was very relieved that that's what the answer was. But he is but also, I you know, what he says, his books are hoping to, he says, if we understand power, then maybe we can vote better and maybe we can have a stronger democracy. So in his search for the truth, his sort of unrelenting search for the truth of what has happened and what can happen, therefore, I think he's telling us we have to, it's a call to action. Yeah. I have to tell you, you know, when you, when you visit uh, that cabin um, in, in Texas, I don't know if that was the Johnson fam family's cabin or one like of what he lived in. But it looks almost just like um, this cabin that's by where I grew up. I grew up uh, in Illinois near the Lincoln Log Cabin, which was Lincoln's parents' cabin that they lived in while he was president. And, you know, it's a, it's a dirt floor, two-room cabin. And um, like one probably Lincoln that Lincoln grew up like as a child. And it's just so striking. I didn't realize that LBJ had grown up that way. It makes you wonder how much their upbringing contributed to their determination, you know, because it was so, so meager and so basic, how much that contributed to their drive to make it to the top. Um, so, on a last note, um, it's so touching the the sticky note that Robert puts on his. They put it on his lamp, yeah. on his writing desk. Yeah. The only thing that matters is on this page. Did you ask him why that's the phrase that he puts on his sticky note? I didn't ask him, but I I will say that 
we definitely kept that in the forefront of our mind. You know, Kara says the only thing that matters is what is on this page. And and as as somebody making a film about him, I think I kept thinking the only thing that matters is this film that we are making. We have to make this the best possible film we can. Do you know? So to have we had that on the one hand, and my father's motto, which is not in the film, is he says there are three things: get it done, do it now, check, check, and check again. So we had these two sort of commandments from these two guys that really kept moving us forward. And I think are very inspiring, you know, do the work, (laughs) get it done, but also that make the best possible thing you can possibly make. That's what I took from Bob Caro's index card. I think he feels the same way about research and writing that I do, which is like research. Yay. It's so fun. (laughs) Writing. Ugh. God, the worst, the worst. It's so interesting when you hear great writers still say that their writing is hard and has never gotten any easier, isn't it? Um, but also it's it's pretty inspiring because, you know, it it sort of makes you feel like, oh, I'm not the only one that has a hard time with this. And just because I have a hard time doesn't mean that I should stop doing it, you know? Well, thank you so much for talking with us about this movie. It's so special and I love it. And thank you for making it. And please tell your dad, thanks for making it. I know he didn't want to. Um, (laughs) When does the movie come out? It comes out in theaters on December 30th. Okay. Well, congratulations. I feel like people are going to love it. And um, congrats to you and good luck to you. Thank you so much. (laughs) 